Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. So good to welcome you here to Finley Lake United Methodist Church. If you're a guest, my name is Pastor Dave, and we're so glad you've joined us uh, for worship this morning. As Anna just sang uh, to God, there is, n- there is no one better than you. And uh, also, as she sang, you turn graves into gardens. And um, maybe Anna knows, I didn't study the, the context or the purpose behind that song, but I have been to the Holy Land, and there is a location where you can go to called the Garden Tomb, which is one of the possible locations where Jesus was uh, in the grave for three days. But the cool thing about that tomb is that it's empty and it's in a beautiful garden. And we do worship the God who is alive. We, we worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who is not in a tomb, but he is risen from the dead. He is alive and he is the one who wants to lead us and meet us here in worship. And that's a God we worship this morning. So that's good news for us as we gather here this morning, no matter how we come in, whether we are on the mountaintop, whether we are in the valley, whether we are joyful, whether we're angry, whether we're frustrated, confused, uncertain about life, we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who is not in a grave, but rose from the dead, and he's alive to meet us here this morning. So it's great to welcome you here. Uh, aren't you glad you're here? We get, to, we get to have our lives reoriented around the God who made us. Uh, the sermon comes later. Got to talk later. Anyways, it's great to see you. Let's enter into the presence of God as we bow in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this new day. It is a new day to experience your love and your grace. God, whether we have thought about you a lot this week, or whether we have not thought about you at all, this morning you are thinking about us. And you want to draw each of us, every person under the sound of my voice, you want to draw us into a deeper love relationship with you. So God, as we worship you, would you help us to not be distracted and to fix our eyes on you, the source, the author of our lives? And would you help us to know that our lives are not an accident? You have created us for a purpose, to know you and walk with you, to experience your love and your power in our lives. And so God, open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to your presence here this morning. God, we are here for you. We lift you up. We honor you. We magnify you. And we pray, Lord, that you would draw us closer to your heart this morning and closer to one another. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on us. Lord, we are not designed to live in human power alone, but God, you are wanting to fill and dwell every person here. So Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So we are in Psalm 111, and we're looking at worship this morning. And uh, we'll read it now, and then we'll come back to it in a moment. But I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 111, and uh, we'll look at this passage all about worship. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart, in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him, but he remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, and we receive it as the authority of our lives for faith and practice. God, we pray that through your word and the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would shine the light of truth into our hearts, that we would receive it, that we would cherish it, that we would digest it, and that we would live accordingly, walking in faith and trust and obedience in a way that would honor you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, leave your finger in Psalm 111. We will be there quite a bit this morning. 
And uh, today we are continuing the series called Growth. And uh, I hope this doesn't seem too childish, but there's the series right there, Growth in Christ. And each letter stands for something. And so as we're looking, oh, they're so good. They have it on the screen. So as we look at this, week one was grace-based living. That's the foundation for life in Christ, for life with God, is to know that we are immersed. We are uh, surrounded by the grace of God. Whether we realize it or not, God shows us sunsets. God reveals his power, he reveals his love, and his grace is that presence and power of God that draws us, that we might be asleep spiritually, but over time we're awakened, and that's part of God's grace to awaken us to our need, to awaken us to his love, and then that grace continues to work in us where we're forgiven and we're transformed and we're um, made new as children of God. That's all a work of grace, and that's where it all begins. And then we looked in week two at reading God's word, the importance of feasting daily on God's word. That's nourishment for our souls. If we are not reading the Bible regularly, we are going to be famished spiritually. We will be dry. We will be dull. We will not have our eyes open to the things of God. And we might walk around saying, I wonder why God's not speaking to me. And the question is, well, are you reading God's word and inviting him to speak? We looked at a real fun topic last week, owning our sin. Wasn't that fun? Recognizing that we are all responsible for the the brokenness and the pain in our world. And uh, so often, especially in our society and in politics and in all different ways, we want to point the fingers at others when in reality we need to look in the mirror at how we ourselves have done things that separate us from God and hurt others. We're careless with our words. We're selfish with our actions. We're harmful with our attitudes and behavior. And we have to own that and say, Lord, forgive me. I am a sinner in need of your grace and forgiveness. And today we're looking at the W of growth in Christ, and that's worship. And that's a really big idea, and today we're going to, have a, we're going to look at a lot about what that means. Um, hopefully we won't be too all over the place, but also worship is such a big idea. It's not just something that happens one hour a week on Sunday. Probably some of you are saying, Dave, it's a little more like an hour and ten minutes. Don't, you know, kid yourself. But it's not just what we do here. It's a lifestyle. It's a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week lifestyle, and we'll get to that. So why don't we look at a definition of worship, or two definitions. These are just from the dictionary. To honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power. And that's a good definition, to honor and show reverence for God. Also, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. That's a, that the dictionary did pretty well. Um, I want to share that worship comes from the words worth ship. And so when we're worshiping God, we are showing God what we think God is worth. Doesn't that put it into perspective? What does your daily life of worship show about how much you think God is worth to you? Is God a God who gets a little bit of leftovers, or does God get your whole being? What What does your lifestyle reveal about what you think God is worth to you. That's a way to really reflect. What do you show that God is worth to you in your time, your money, your decisions, all of that? So, but so often we reduce it. We think worship is just one hour a week on Sunday, and we might reduce it further even more than that. Worship is just the singing portion of what we do on Sunday. Well, singing is a really important part of worship. We sing to the Lord. We proclaim who he is through song, but worship is everything. It's the attention we're giving God right now. It's the the attitude in our hearts to go out here and serve with passion and obedience. It's it's not just what we do here. It's loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. It's waking up each day, and rather than waking up, oh, good Lord, it's morning. It's good morning, Lord, right? There's a difference. Do you wake up, good morning, Lord, or good Lord, it's morning? Which way? Waking up with that God has given me life. He's given me another day. He's given me plans. He's given me purposes. Waking up with that attitude, that's worship. And if worship is just about the nine to five five grind, another day, another dollar, earn money, spend money, go to bed, do it again the next day, we're missing out on the reason we were created, which really is to worship God and to give God our loving attention and devotion. And that happens, again, 24 7 Uh, 365 days a year. When you're driving, I love going on 86 towards 90 in the evening as the sun is setting and looking out over Lake Erie and looking at the sunset 
And even that drive to Erie from here can be a time to say, God, you are an awesome God. You are an amazing artist. Your works are wonderful. You know, when you're walking through your home late at night and it's dark and you stub your toe, you're still a worshiper. So maybe you need to transform your words a little and rather than say something, maybe you say, God, thank you for my pain receptors or something. You can channel, you can channel it around and focus on the fact that you are a worshiper, you are in a relationship with God your entire life. Everything about your life is to be about worship. And it doesn't mean we walk around like this everywhere, but, be, but the foundation of how we think and how we live is I belong to the Lord and my life is about worshiping him. Did you know that a conversation that you have with another person can be worship or it can be rebellion? What's your attitude as you go to have a conversation with someone? Is it to get the best of them and to be uh, angry and to put them down? And to, that's an act of rebellion. But if you say, Lord, I'm going to love this person as you call me to love them. I'm going to love them as I love myself. I'm going to love them in a way that shows I love you. A conversation can be an act of worship depending on what your attitude is and what your focus is. I'd like to just share for a moment, and this will be woven throughout this morning, what if we thought of worship kind of like we thought of a marriage or relationship with our spouse? And I hate to say it, but in Scripture, God is the faithful groom, right? And we are often referred to, or as God's people are often the unfaithful bride. But let's just think about worship the way we think about marriage. How would it go, guys, if you're walking with your wife or your significant other and you pass a little display of flowers for sale and you look at your wife and you're, there's some flowers, I, I probably have to get those for you, right? I mean, how that, how's that going to go? Do you have to get those flowers or do you have the opportunity to get those flowers? See, there's a difference. Uh, I see those flowers and you're looking at me and I have to get those flowers. Or is that... I want to show you my love and my devotion to you. I get to buy you flowers. There's flowers here and I love you. I get to buy those flowers for you. There, there's a, a, a difference in attitude, right? Worship is not, I have to do this. It's, I get to do this. You know, I hope that was your attitude when you came here this morning. It's not, Sunday, have to go to church. It's, I get to go to church. I get to come and worship in freedom and experience the greatest news that will be on my mind all week. Unless I'm in the scriptures, that's going to be great news too. But thinking about the God who loves me and has plans and purposes and dreams for me, that's good news. It's not I have to buy flowers. It's not I have to go to church. It's I get to go to church. I get to worship. I get to be in relationship with this God who loves me. All right, thinking about worship as marriage, how would it go? Well, honey, we had a good day today. We had a nice date, good lunch. I was devoted to you all day today. Tomorrow, the rest of the week, I'm going to be seeing some other people, you know, but don't worry about it next Sunday or whatever. You know, we'll have another date next week. How's that going to go? Is worship a one day a week or one hour a week phenomenon in our lives that then leaves us unaffected the rest of the week? Or is worship, I'm worshiping God in a one particular important way here corporately with my brothers and sisters in Christ. But when I leave this place, I'm still worshiping. When I get in my car and I'm driving down the road, I'm worshiping. I'm thinking about the truth of God. I'm being overwhelmed by the awe and beauty of creation all around. I'm thinking about how am I going to bless someone because God has blessed me. That's worship. It, it, it hap what happens here is really important, but it's not just here, it's what's out there. And when we're with our spouse, it's not, well, we had a nice date this week. I'm going to just go around and do other things and see other people, but then next week we'll be, you know, we'll go out for lunch. I'll treat you some, you know, Panera, someplace great. It's an every day, a week, it's a lifestyle of expressing our love and our devotion and our relationship to God. You know, one of the most disappointing and frustrating things that happens within the human heart is when the human heart drifts. Did you know, I spent a lot of time watching Ben, sometimes sailing with Ben last, last year. Hopefully that water will eventually thaw and we'll have a lake to look at. Well, it's beautiful now, but hopefully it'll be in liquid form, not solid form, uh, in the months ahead. But when Ben sails, he actively adjusts the sail to the wind. And he holds on to the rudder, is that what it's called? And steers to steer the boat to orient his sail to the wind. If you drop the sail and you don't try to steer the boat, you're going to drift and you're going to shipwreck the boat. 
What's so sad in relationships, marriages, faith, whether it's a marriage or whether it's faith with God, the same thing happens. If we are not orienting our life towards, towards God and seeking his plans, his purposes, and we let down the sail of our hearts and we don't care about how the wind of God's spirit wants to move us, we're going to drift. And we hear that from time to time in relationships with people and relationships with God. Well, we fell out of love. You know, we just don't love each other anymore. And it's like, well, the, the tendency of the human heart is to drift without, without active engagement in that love relationship. We sang about it, was it last week or the week before? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And it's, it's about the grace of God and how God can correct that. But that's the tendency of the human heart to drift. And so if we're not actively investing in that relationship, we're going to drift. And so when people say, well, we fell out of love, we just drifted apart, you know, my first question is, when did you stop investing in one another? When did you stop expressing your love and devotion to one another? Because you will drift if you're not orienting the sail of your heart towards the Lord, if you're not orienting the direction of your heart towards your spouse, there's going to be a drifting, but we're called to be actively engaged, investing in those relationships. Worship is how we express our love and devotion to God every moment of every day. I do want us to dive into Psalm 111 for a few moments, and let's just touch on some of these verses as we walk through this passage. Notice how the psalm writer writes about praising the Lord with a little bit of my heart. No. What does it say? The psalm writer writes, praising the Lord with all my heart. We don't give God the scraps and the leftovers. We give God our entire being. We say, God, I belong to you. We've said before, Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. You don't say to your spouse, well, I'm yours on Sunday, but then the rest of the week, just don't worry about it. We give our entire selves, our faithfulness to God, and we say, God, I am yours. Every day of the week, I belong to you. I give you all my heart. And it says, in the council of the upright and in the assembly. So it uses those words and it makes it clear. Worship is about what we do on our own, but there's something powerful about corporate worship. You know, sometimes people say, well, I can worship God when I'm in the woods or when I'm, working, or when I'm walking along the beach. Absolutely. But that doesn't take the place or substitute for worshiping with the assembly of God's people because we're not just formed as individuals. We're formed as a community of people. Who love, the, who love God. What are we in Scripture? We are a priesthood of believers. We all have a role to play as servants of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're part of the same family. Together, we are the bride of Christ, and that's corporate. That's, that's community. And so, yes, my, my walk with God is important, but my walk with, with God in context, in relationship with the body of Christ, that's even more important because together, we are God's family. Together, we are God's people. God saves individuals one by one, but he saves us in the context of the body of Christ, the church. And so it says we we worship in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Worship is both private and corporate. One doesn't substitute for the other. They both go hand in hand. We worship privately through prayer, through through reading scripture, through listening to praise and worship music. That's all private worship on our own, but we also come together and Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered, there am I with them. Let's look at verse two. Great are the works of the Lord. How do we worship? We worship by giving God praise for his great works, the things God has made. When was the last time you were breathless or you were in awe because of a sunset or a sunrise? or a starry sky, or just the the view of Lake Erie, or just the beauty of nature, the beauty of a little child's face. Uh, At Men's Fellowship, I was encouraged, Don Blakesley was talking about a book by John Eldridge, and he talked about how so often we don't think about the playful side of God, and how you can see two little chipmunks running along, and they're wrestling, and they're playing, and they're twirling, and that's all part of God's design for creation. You know, the, the beauty, the playfulness of God, there's We want to see God's holiness, his power, but also we want to see the loving, playful, 
uh, relational side of who God is, but we, we praise God for his works, the starry night sky, the sunrise, the sunset, the planets God spun into orbit, the playful chipmunks, all of that are the works of God that we give him praise for. And so we, God is worthy of worship because all he has made. And then verse 3, it goes from his works to his deeds. So glorious and majestic are his deeds. Now the psalm writer is praising God for the deeds, the things he has done. And here, specifically, we can think, well, what did God do in the nation of Israel? He delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. He parted the Red Sea so they could cross on dry ground. He gave them the law and the commandments. He formed them as a nation, as a community. So they were praising God for his glorious and majestic deeds. This is Old Testament. Now, as New Covenant believers, how much more do we have to praise God for? That God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to rescue and redeem you to pour out his love upon you, to show you that you matter, to show you that your, God doesn't abandon you. When we are sinners, when we are failures, when we go the wrong way, Jesus still says, I have come to rescue and win you back, to reach you and transform you with my love. We praise God for his glorious and majestic deeds. Jesus offered his broken body, his shed blood, to deliver us from slavery to sin. God has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell us, to fill us, to give us power to live as new people. God forgives us. He transforms us. He makes us children of God. He breathes new life into us, and he promises us everlasting life. And that's a reason to praise God for his deeds. Verse 4, he has caused his wonders to be remembered. Now we're thinking even more about God's miracles, God's healing power, God's ability to transform relationships, God's ability to breathe new life and hope into the anxious and depressed. God's ability when one chapter is so broken and so painful, God's able to turn the page and say, by my grace, there's a new chapter for you. And it involves living in my love and, and living into the purposes I have for you. We praise God for his wonders, and those wonders can be seen through his miracles, through a changed heart. The greatest miracle is when a sinner experiences forgiveness and is born into the family of God through faith. Those are all God's miraculous wonders and reasons to give him thanks and praise. Verse 5 says, He provides food for those who fear him. Everything that comes up from the ground is God's provision for our lives. God provides what we need. He provides the daily bread, both physical and spiritual. He is our provider. Jesus is our sustainer. He has also provided for us redemption, which means when we went our own way, he paid the price offering himself to win us back. These are all reasons to praise God because he provides for us. He provides food, both physical and spiritual. Notice throughout the passage that God is worshipped for his attributes. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Re these are all reasons to praise God no matter what's going on in our lives. God is gracious and compassionate. He remembers his covenant, his promises. He is faithful and just. His precepts are trustworthy. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving my soul, the scripture says. Verse 10, and I know we're just touching on this passage, but verse 10 is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does that mean? We're not talking about I'm scared of God, but I have ultimate respect and reverence and awe for who God is. That's what it means to fear the Lord. God is so big and I am so small in comparison, but I fear God. I have reverence for God. He deserves my reverence. And then it says, all who follow his precepts have good understanding. That means we're to follow God. We're to follow now Jesus and to walk in joyful obedience. And it says, to him belongs eternal praise because he is so worthy of it. You know, I want to share that when we worship God, it is for God. Sometimes people will say, well, I went to worship. I didn't get anything out of it. And the, and the question is, well, what did you think you were supposed to get out of it? The question is, what did God get out of it from you? Did God get your loving attention? Did God get your rested body that woke up ready and expectant to meet with God? Did God get your, your attention that when you went in and the word of God was open, you were saying, God, I am a sponge. Refresh me with your life-giving water of truth. The question is not, what did I get out of it? But what did God get out of it? Worship is about him. But make no mistake, when we worship, we do experience something from the Lord. 
we experience a new perspective. When we worship God and we are filled with awe and wonder of his greatness, what do you think happens to the size of our problems? What, happen, what, what happens when God is this big and we're, we're dealing with a broken heart or questions about our finances or uncertainty about a job or school or uncertainty about the future? When our mind is so fixed by the power and the greatness of God, all of our problems shrink in comparison. I like the way Francis Chan says it. He says, and I want you to picture Jesus. Hopefully when you worship, when you sing, you you take a moment just in your mind's eye to think about Jesus high and lifted up in the throne of heaven, angels and people who have gone before us worshiping him 24 hours a day, seven days a week singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But listen to what Francis Chan says. If we could see God for just five seconds, we wouldn't be focused on our problems. We would be breathless. Isn't that the truth? If we could just get a glimpse of God, the one who created the starry skies and spun the planets into orbit, if we could just get a glimpse of his glory for five seconds, we would be on our faces breathless, not giving one care about our problems because our mind would be fixed on Christ. And that's what Paul says in Colossians 3. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Set your minds on things above. We're so focused on things below that we're overwhelmed with chaos and confusion. And we're instructed to set our minds and our hearts on things above. What a precious girl. I'm sorry. I just, that's great and miraculous are the works of God. And that's evidence right there of it. But worship is about giving our whole love and attention to an audience of one. And when we worship, we don't just go through the motions, we don't just sit on our hands, but we give God everything we have. We kneel, we bow, we lift up holy hands, we sing, we speak, we dance. Cuba's a little better than that than we are, just just saying. But we dance, we give God glory, we give God our entire selves. We don't just say, well, I gotta worship, or I have to worship. It's I get to worship, and we offer God our entire being. We, we open our mouths and we, pro, we proclaim God's greatness. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, we may not feeling like it. If you stepped on the dog and tripped, I mean, on your way to church, you may not feel like worshiping. But, you know, something happens. I said it's not about what we get out of it, but when we worship God and we see him in all his glory and we'll, we proclaim his good works, our souls are revived. Our perspective is broadened. The purpose for which we were created, that's all, we're all reminded of that. The idea that we're alone and isolated and bitter and divided as a nation, we come together and it's, we are brothers and sisters in Christ because of an awesome God who loves us and brought us into his family to be his, to be the greatest hope this world will ever know. We're no longer lonely and isolated, right? We're united by the Spirit of God, the greatest magnet for human relationships that we can ever know. The Spirit of God that unites us together as one body in Christ. And so when we worship, we don't just give God our leftovers. We don't just sit on our hands. We say, I don't have to worship. I get to worship. And I'm going to live the one and only life I have on this earth to be a blessing to the God who made me and created me. Again, don't don't get me wrong. Sometimes life is so hard and so painful. But even when we face the the worst this world has to offer, even when we face the valley of the shadow of death, we remember this is not the end. Death does not have the last word. Jesus has the last word. My life is in his hands. He's promised me an everlasting future. If I just receive him into my life and ask for him to forgive me and make me a child of God, I am born into his family and my destiny is everlasting life where there is no more sorrow, crying, or pain. That's good news. And that's a perspective we have when we worship. Everything else fades in comparison because of how great and big and awesome God is. So what does your lifestyle of worship reveal about what God is worth to you? Do you give God the leftovers or do you give him your entire being saying, Lord, you are the one who created me in the first place. 
You are the one who wants to recreate me. You gave me life. You want to offer me everlasting life. That's what God wants us to be focused on, giving our whole selves because of who he is and what he's done for us. You know, one, one last thing about worship as we start to wrap up. You know, I think so often, I, and just bringing this back around to marriage, so often people think about the big ceremony, I want the great wedding, the big ceremony, the party, and then I want the happily ever after. I want the, the happily ever after together. And it's almost like they think about the two bookends, the party, the ceremony, and then the happily ever after. Not remembering at the forefront of their minds it's ultimately what happens between those things. It's about investing in that love relationship each and every day. And I wonder if sometimes that's what it's like for us as believers, those who uh, put our faith and trust in Jesus. It's about that beginning commitment to God. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Don't get me wrong. That's the most important decision a person can ever make, to begin that relationship with God and invite Jesus to come in and forgive us and wash us and make us new. And so they think, I want to have that great beginning. I've asked Jesus into my life, and I want to have the happily ever after in heaven. But it is left right there about the two bookends. While well, worship is what fills in the gaps between becoming a Christian through that commitment to Jesus and it living the happily ever after it's about what happens each and every day as we express our thanksgiving, our praise, our devotion to the living God from bookend to bookend. And then when we get to the second bookend, we realize that it doesn't stop there, but worship in the everlasting kingdom of God will continue. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Worship is all of it. It is an act of worship to give your life to Jesus. For some, that might be the very first step today to say, Lord, I've been going my own way, and you want me to, to humble myself, confess my sin, and invite you in. And the good news about that is then you do have the hope and promise of everlasting life. But don't forget the daily living for Christ Jesus in between those two bookends. And it's just like that with marriage. It's not just about the wedding, and it's not just about a happily ever after that hopefully will happen somewhere. It's about the daily living, expressing your love and your devotion each and every day. I want to close with a story that I've shared before. And my apologies to those of you who are long timers, but we have a lot of newcomers as well. But I want to tell you about a time in college when I was going out with Heather. She, we had been together about three years. We got together our freshman year, and I think it was senior year. And so we were looking forward to marriage in a few weeks' time. My friend Ryan had a new relationship with his girlfriend, Amy. And uh, Ryan came to me one day and he said, Hey, Dave, let's go pick some flowers for our sweethearts. I'm like, All right, let's do it. And so we got in his pickup truck and left the Messiah College campus and drove about a mile or two off campus. And Ryan had said, well, there's some great lilac bushes just off the campus grounds. And so we drove just a couple minutes. He pulls his pickup truck along these um, lilac bushes in front of this big open field. And he says, all right, let's pick some flowers. And I'm like, okay. So I got down and I picked just a couple flowers and was ready to go. And um, Ryan did something that kind of surprised me. He got in the back of his pickup truck and got a chain. I think some of you know the story. And he hooked up the chain to his pickup truck, and he took the other end of the chain, and he walked to this gigantic lilac bush, and he wrapped it around that huge bush a few times, and he got back in his pickup truck, and he gunned it, and that bush went... Bruh! And then he took the chain, and he unwrapped it, and he put it in the back of his pickup truck, and he picked up that entire lilac bush like this, and he's like all right, let's go find uh, Amy and Heather. And I'm thinking, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I don't, Heather, I, I, I was expressing my complete love to you, I promise, with my little flowers. But that, that story, you know, has stuck in my mind as a whisper from God saying, what kind of worshiper do you want to be? Do you want to be kind of like the you know, just to go through the motions, you know, offer God my little small handful of flowers? Or do we want to be the worshiper that says, God, I love you? 
You are the one who gave me life in the first place. You are the one that is able to heal all my pain, forgive all my sin, remove from me the the, the darkness of my depression and give me hope and new life and a future that's fixed on you. And God, it's not about the leftovers. It's not about a Sunday morning. It's about a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week, 365-days-a-year lifestyle where I offer you everything that I have. And you know what the beautiful thing about this is? We cannot outgive God. We cannot outgive God. And you might say, well, I don't always feel like it. You know, our feelings rise and fall. But when we invest in a relationship with the Lord, he, he gives us far more than what we can ask or imagine in terms of that, that experience of knowing and walking with God and knowing that we are loved and our lives are in his hands. It doesn't mean life is always rosy. Don't hear from me, well, if you worship God, life is peachy and rosy and everything's easy. That is, that's far from the case. But what it does mean is that when we are walking with God and we are invested in that life-giving relationship, when we face the dark times, we know the Lord is with me. He's going to see me through. The body of Christ is with me. They're a shoulder to lean on and cry on. And together we move forward as worshipers. So church, what kind of worshipers do we want to be? A church that gives God the leftovers, that sits on our hands? Or a church that's filled with with people who say, Lord, in Jesus, you have offered me everything, even that which I don't deserve. And all I can do is offer you my life, my heart, my whole self, each and every day, to honor you, to return thanks, and to express my love, my devotion, and my trust. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and overwhelm us with a sense of who you are. God, so often we can just go through the motions, we can just uh, be lazy, we can be apathetic. God, would you awaken us to your greatness today? I think about how Jesus, when people met you in the scriptures, it says they were astonished. They, They were overwhelmed, they were in awe, they would fall on their knees God, would you make us that kind of worshiper that we would experience your presence and your power in a way that would astonish us, that we would not go through the motions, we would not sit on our hands, but that we would give you our whole selves. Lord, you are worthy of far more than we could ever give you. You have given us salvation. You have given us Jesus. You have offered us everlasting life. Help us to receive you with grateful hearts and live for you with all that we have. And all God's people said, amen, amen. It's a human tendency that sometimes we drift. You know, the scriptures are all about wake up, O sleeper. And it is easy for us to fall asleep sometimes in terms of just being spiritually, uh, spiritually unaware of how God is at work. My prayer is that we would just go from this place saying, Lord, wake me up. Wake me up and help me be aware of your presence in my life, of your love for me, of the purposes for which you've created me. What I love in the scriptures is that throughout Uh, encounters that Jesus has with people, the people are astonished. And that's my prayer as we look for the sunsets this week, as we look for the starry skies, as we look at the beauty of little children, that we would just say, Lord, astonish me with your greatness. Wake me up to who you want me to be. Wake me up to who you are and help me to be fully alive to your love and your promises because that's how God desires for us to live. Thanks so much for coming to worship. If you have any spiritual needs, physical needs. If there are things like food or help or just somebody to talk to, we would love to help. Please come see me. I'd love to um, point you in the right direction. And uh, as we go from this place, seeking to be wholehearted worshipers of Almighty God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You are loved, friends. Take care.